Olá, pessoal. Bem-vindos. Hoje, então, estamos num horário diferente aqui do, dos seminários, mas porque nós temos um palestrante da Alemanha. Então, a, a gente ia ter com a gente também a Ana, que é fundadora da, da ONG chamada Melly Bees, mas ela está com problemas para entrar aqui no Teams, então espero que ela consiga entrar ainda hoje para falar um pouquinho sobre a ONG para vocês. Então, essa palestra, ela faz parte de uma série de palestras uh, que vão estar dentro do, desde os seminários que a gente fez em parceria com elas, com ela, né, com essa ONG. Todas vão se tratar de abelhas ou conservação, que é o tema da ONG. Então, espero que vocês aproveitem hoje e... Uh, Bom, que tenham perguntas, eu vou falar também, o professor ele fala um pouco português, mas a gente pode, podem mandar pergunta em português ou em inglês, daí eu traduzo, ou quem, se alguém falar alemão, pode falar em alemão também, é isso, aí eu não vou saber, e, e hoje nós temos um tema muito interessante, então eu vou apresentar primeiro o I was speaking English now just to to give this um, this message for people that don't speak Portuguese because I believe we have some people from abroad today as well here. Uh, so I was explaining that Anna, that is the coordinator of Melly Bees, she couldn't uh, yet. Uh, she's having problems with things. But I hope she will come and talk a little bit about uh, the organization. But if she doesn't come, I hope she comes uh, the next <laughs> talk. So this is a series of talks that I have organized with her uh, inside the talks that we have in our graduate program. Um, so today we have um, Professor Martin Hasselmann. He is a professor, professor at the University of Hohenheim in Germany. Uh, he studies um, mainly evolution, but um, so one I took from the, his uh, site uh, some uh, things that he researched. So he studies local adaptation and evolutionary innovations in social insects population dynamics of sex determining allelins in bees, also genome evolution in social insects, population genetics of invasive beetles, microbiota and pathogen diversity interaction in social insects, mitochondrial haplotype diversity and fun function in laying hands. So, Today he's going to talk about evolution and in bees, and I hope everybody enjoy. And um, I would like to thank uh, Martin uh, for for your participation here. And uh, it's late in Germany, so you should be resting now. But I, I'm glad that we could work a time that is good for for everyone to attend uh, your talk. And uh, the talk, uh, we recorded it and I put it on YouTube. So if you wa if anyone wants to watch again or know someone that couldn't be here and wants to watch, it will be available after. So Martin, I will uh, let you talk now and we will talk about the questions at the end. Thank you very much for being here today. Yeah, muito obrigado. Olá, boa tarde a todos. Estou muito feliz por estar dando uma palestra aqui hoje. Como falo um pouco de português, continuarei agora em inglês. <laughs> so, I, I had some coffee just to stay awake. And of course, um, I know share my screen which hopefully should work so that you can see everything yes 
Okay, so yeah, this yes, is um, this the top. It. Oh, perfect, obrigado. <clears throat> and yeah, as Patricia already has said, <clears throat> the title of my talk is Diversity, Importance and Evolution of, of Bees. Just uh, to provide you a brief overview about myself, <clears throat> I'm a biologist by training, a classical um, zoologist with a focus on um, insects. I did my doctoral thesis in 2004, um, also about honeybees already. Then I moved as assistant professor and group leader uh, to the universities first in Cologne and then afterwards um, uh, first to Düsseldorf and then to Cologne. And since 2014, I'm a full professor and department chair in Stuttgart University in Hohenheim. Um, as you can see here um, on the right the picture, this is a pretty nice place, which is not the institute building, which is just the main building of uh, where administrations, for instance, are, and the dean and the vice presidents are located. Um, just a brief background already mentioned already um, about main focus of my uh, department. <clears throat> we are studying a variety of interactions at different levels. First, <clears throat> yes, abiotic factors like climate or nutrition, like biotic aspects, <clears throat> microbes and inter-individual interactions and the interaction with yeah, these environmental factors. And we want to go deeper at the molecular level and, and studying the yeah, interaction and dynamics of genes, of alleles, trying also to decipher certain innovations in regulatory pathways, mainly yeah, in bees, in beetles, and even we had a recent uh, larger cooperation project in laying hands. So in overall, we want to decipher um, if there are any evolutionary principles and that are triggered or driven by the lifestyle or even by the social lifestyle when you're focused on, on bees. A brief overview for my talk today. So we'll first um, we'll go to a brief journey of the, let's say, really fascinating diversity of bees. Then I will have a brief outline um, of the enormous importance of bees, or which you probably um, already aware of this. And then I uh, take a last example um, of one of these evolutionary aspects in social organized bees that I'm particular fascinate most over the last years. Let's have a look on the insect diversity. When you have here um, an overview of all um, living organisms, uh, you see that about 60% of all living organisms are insects. And even when you include all arthropods, um, the non-insective um, arthropods included, you have even more up to 75%. Um, so there's a huge biomass and the huge diversity um, at this level of, of insect species worldwide. And many of them are even not yet described so far. By having a closer look into this particular insect diversity, you get here an impression of the main groups of um, yeah, higher ranked orders. And interestingly, about 83% of all insects belong to the holometabola. As you probably know this from your studies and whatever you hear from it, um, these holometabola um, are characterized by a complete metamorphosis from egg over larvae pupae development. Uh, fundamental aspects on, on developmental um, yeah, and structural reorganization of entire bodies. So, and within this entire uh, holometabola, you see large groups and the largest ones belongs to the coleoptera, the beetles, the lepidoptera, the 
butterflies, the diptera, the flies, mm. and here we have the hymenoptera, which is about 13% of bees, wasps, and ants represented within that group. By having a closer look now, as we are talking or aim to talk today <laughs> about some bees, um, let's switch to these bees. What are these bees? So we are within the hymenopteran and they are belonging to the Antophila, the Apoidea. And the current classification are grouping these bees into seven families. You can see here, and about 25 subfamilies. So we have main groups um, belonging to the long ton bees here, <clears throat> like the Apidae and the Megachile, and shorter tongue bees, short tongue bees, like Andrenidae, Halictidae, and Colletidae, for instance. In total, we are reaching almost 20,000 described species. And from the evolutionary point of view, you see that they arose already like in the mid Cretacean, Cretacean time, approximately 140 to 110 million years ago. And this is particularly interesting because um, this time roughly coincides with the origin and early diversification of flowering plants. Already, you can see there's obviously a strong um, importance and maybe an even close co evolutionary aspect and may hint about that. Having picking, let's say, one of these uh, major groups uh, in a little bit more detail within the Apide, you come to this Apide group, which is pretty much the largest group within these bees and with more than 5,700 described species, you find the greatest diversity in the neotropical and oriental regions. Interestingly, if you zoom here in briefly, um, you see kleptoparasitic um, form an own clade. And here, for instance, within the Apine line, you may find even um, bees that are you more familiar with, with the names, the Bombini, Meliponini, and Apini Euglucini. I come to that later again. Interestingly, within these Apide, there's an enormous diversity of life histories. We can't tackle them, of course, here in the detail, but <clears throat> overall you will find, for instance, from the nesting behavior and histories, the ground and wood or even stem nest building bees. You will find oil collecting bees, for instance, we have kleptoparasitic species, as I mentioned already before. And you see here in the right upper corner that these numbers of species can reach particular high numbers. For instance, these kleptoparasitic bees can reach more than 600 species. One of these nomadini, for instance, and even within the Apine, there are a couple of groups that reach high numbers. Again, from the evolutionary point of view, primitive and up to advanced eusocial organization is one of the hallmarks and of particular interest also for the research community. And they are mainly studied and um, characterized in, in bumblebees, for instance, stingless bees and honeybees. I will come back to that later again. When you have a look on uh, stingless bees, and we are in now like focused on Brazil, for instance, where I stayed also um, several months on research stays in, in University at Ufam in, in Manaus, for instance, um, over the last years, and in the south also in Ribeirão Preto. So um, you find stingless bees like a pantropical distribution, like here, like a, this blue, blue belt around the globe um, of stingless bees with about 500 species, more or less, worldwide. And <clears throat> 
his stingless bees are really uh, amazing yeah, creatures, let's say it like this. They build, for instance, characteristic nest entrances. As you can see here, some examples, um, mainly as a protection against predators, which are pretty common in the tropics and, and subtropics. So they collect uh, numbers of different materials and even glue them with resin to avoid, for instance, entrances of, of certain ants. The variety of these different ant nest entrances um, are in parts like genus or, or family specific. And so these stingless bees are in particular intensive interaction with the envi environment because they collect um, different aspects like mud, for instance, here you can see, or resins from trees here, and of course, pollen. You can see here these typical pots of pollen within um, Melipona stingless bee nests. Mm. It's are like small mini fermenters. Um, I was tasting uh, different pollen from different uh, stingless bees when I spent time in Manaus, and you have amazing variety of flavor and high acid is low pH, for instance. From the nest structure, yeah, we're having a look into these stingless bees. They are pretty different when compared, for instance, to, to honeybees, because interestingly, they provide here, again, I can zoom in, maybe uh, these typical honey pots where they collect um, pretty liquid honey. They build their comb in different layers where they develop in a brood. And in different separate pots, they provide here, for instance, in one another species, um, again, the collection of the pollen. Artificial nests, as you can see here, are now more and more in, in the practice um, to also for studying, of course, um, stingless bees in a research community. Traditionally, um, of course, they are cave breeders. And you see here, for instance, uh, a part of a tree trunk where these different levels, like here the brood comes and um, the pots of honey are located within that tree. This is of course, of course a, a very important point when it comes to the conversation, um, conver conservation aspect, because um, man would be foster the initiative to produce more like artificial nests um, to avoid, for instance, cutting down trees to uh, to collect honey from um, Melipona stingless bees um, that are like build a nest in in tree trunks. So you now think about the importance of bees, and immediately um, it may come to your attention that. They are clearly the most important group of plant pollinating insects. So, and that's what I was mentioning before, millions of years of co-evolution has driven a close and in parts highly specific interaction of these pollinating insects and their um, host plants. And pollen collection of species can range from, from single you call it monolectic bees to up to different sources or of pollen plants like polylectic bees. Just to provide an overview here from from a study uh, 2019 um, where people were collecting uh, data about the distribution of the monolectic, oligolectic and polylectic bees here you see the, the majority of bees among the different uh, lineages uh, within the Apinae are 
polylactic and only few highly specialized uh, bee species among these different lineages are monolactic. Easily to understand is the importance of bees when it comes um, as yeah, important pollinator for wild um, plants. It's, it's about a number of 88% of all wild plant species are pollinated by, by bees. And it has even a high number, similar high number when it comes to managed um, or agricultural products, um, managed fruits and, and vegetables, which is about 70% um, <clears throat> pollinated by bees. So contributing in total to one third of the global human diet, um, this is directly derived from fruits and vegetables primarily pollinated by bees, underlines the importance of these bees from the economical point of view. And just have here some numbers to illustrate this. I didn't uh, recalculate this in reais or dollars, so these are euros, but you can do this by your own. So we have an estimated economical impact um, given here is this, this paper cited above where we have about 153 billion euros of economical impact worldwide. For Germany, uh, it's about two and a half billion, simply counted by the total valuable chain that is behind these pollinator activities in the fruit and vegetable sectors. And here you see, for instance, the importance of bumblebees, which are heavily used in greenhouses for tomatoes, paprika, and strawberry pollination, for instance. Or even here in um, almond trees areas um, where honeybees are like almost on an industrial level industry are placed. To, to pollinate during this high peak of flowering season of this tree. The production, the products that bees can provide um, plays an overall given mainly by the pollinator activity, these bees as a third most important livestock animal honeybees in particular here. But beside honeys, honey as a product, many other parts provided by the bees, produced by the bees are of commercial interest. As you can see here, for instance, wax, pollen, propolis, royal jelly, bee venom, and of course, yeah, the pollination activity as I already mentioned before. So far, a variety of um, yeah, products are mainly focused on, on honeybees. This is, of course, clearly also an aspect uh, given this yeah, widely distribution and, and strongly managed uh, underlying uh, basis of these bees. This economic importance can be even within honeybees a little bit more uh, yeah, split up into the different uh, major bee species we find within the honeybees. When you have here, for instance, candidates of the traditional cave breeding or hive bees, which is the Western European honeybee, which is now widespread all over the world. And the close relative, the Eastern uh, honeybee, Apis serrana, distributed in Asia. <coughs> and also, um, has an economic importance, the free building yeah, bees like Apis dorsata and Apis laboriosa, the giant bees. Um, they build huge combs, single combs, 
as you can see here, for instance, um, the traditional honey hunter of Apis and Laboyosa in a very, yeah, not really sustainable way, um, cutting down these huge combs directly from the walls and, and hanging high above to harvest the honey and the brood and the wax. One of my PhD students in my group um, is from Ethiopia, from the north of Ethiopia region and Tigray. He provided me uh, these pictures and to, to illustrate um, how honeybee beekeeping um, can, for instance, also take place in the tropic and subtropic regions in Ethiopia is uh, with more than 4 million honeybee hives and um, pretty important yeah, honeybee producing and, and honeybee commercial country. Um, interestingly, they have many traditional hives and which has a high um, importance as regular income for people. And these traditional hives you can see here, for instance, on the, on the below. Nevertheless, of course, management um, are really challenging given, of course, the availability of material and also the yeah, conditions and where uh, people are rather living under very yeah, simple conditions and have sometimes even difficulties to access the, these colonies properly. But there's <clears throat> ongoing efforts um, to, to improve the situation. Yeah, and we are looking looking forward how this is going to develop. And maybe you are also aware of this uh, fascinating and from the evolutionary point again, also striking example of a successful invasion, these Africanized honeybees. So these Africanized honeybees resulted from an rather accidentally release of a cross of yeah, hybrids of Western European bees in the south of Brazil with a cross <clears throat> and introduced bees from South Africa in the late 50s to originally improve um, the local or these yeah, Apis mellifera bees in, in Brazil. Nevertheless, the resulting um, yeah, hybrids are have a much lower threshold for defense behavior. They develop long lasting attacks over several hours after disturbing colonies. And in contrast to the Western European honeybee, these hybrids, these Africanized honeybees, they attack over a range of several hundred meters and have an extreme swarming and absconding tendency. So, and this yeah, successful invasion story spread all over, starting from Brazil in the late 50s, now reaching, yeah, already in the late 90s, South California, Texas, Arizona. So I can, yeah, could talk more about that, <laughs> but uh, for the moment, um, yeah, I would now switch to one from the evolutionary point of view again, uh, this amazing transition in evolution, a major transition evolution. This is a social organization. Um, and this, of course, is um, represented by the specific caste that you can find within bees and the production and, and work and differentiation um, of labor activities. And I would like to introduce also this famous person here on the right side. Maybe you don't know him, Theodosius Dubchansky. Theodosius Dubchansky, a Russian um, population geneticist, uh, was working in the US and he made this important sentence that nothing in biology makes sense except in the light of evolution. So, and 
joining these two aspects um, and in particular I was also fascinated by studying within social organized bees um, exciting aspects of of evolution which I would like to take you now in the next slides again what is yeah social sociality use sociality these are primitive and and advanced um, use sociality I just mentioned before here you find an overview from a yeah, publication in previous time <clears throat> from colleagues where you can see um, some major representatives from yeah, highly eusocial bees like the honeybees Apis mellifera or the dwarf honeybee Apis florea and um, the stingless bees actually like here for instance melipona or frisa milita they are here you have the information about what is highly eusocial large colonies, you have perennial colonial cycle, you have highly specialized queen and worker cast, and you have, for instance, long live queens, now extended lifespan of the queen. And interestingly, you have also nutritional influence on caste development. Primitive primitively use social bees rather than belonging to much smaller colonies with an annual colony cycle, less specialized queen worker castes, and some yeah, dominance hierarchies within the colonies. And even non-use social, almost can say yeah, yeah, solitary or communal, yeah, interliving, sharing a nest, Bees, <clears throat> for instance, here the orchid bees belong to that group. And having here on these lineages already an indication about the time and an evolutionary time frame, um, you see, okay, this major split in the past happened quite a long time ago, 80, more than 80 million years ago. In the last um, yeah, couple of years, I was working together with colleagues um, from the US and also Brazil um, together in a project where we are analyzing genome sequences from 10 bees um, that represent different levels of yeah, sociality or social organization. Here, for instance, um, again, these candidates of um, yeah, highly eusocially organized bees, Melipona, Apis florea, then the primitive and the yeah, solitary bees. And um, interestingly, we noticed um, that we have within these lineages uh, two independent um, yeah, examples from solitary to primitive Usability. Here, these white marks one and two, and the evolution to a rather advanced usability. These marks here to Melipona and to Apis lineage. You see here on the right side again, these bees are characterized by different yeah, population sizes. So these ten to four represents like colony sizes and just to make a very long and very complex um, story short uh, there is no single way and no single yeah, path to this highly used social behavior or use social organization but rather than a complex network of yeah, interaction Interestingly, of genes that are um, specifically in, in certain lineages um, selected or with a certain adaptive advantage over the time. And in parallel, also there are modifications, um, we call it yeah, methylation patterns, uh, by increasing the level of usociality. 
So this was a rather complex um, yeah, study together with these colleagues, um, which is public available. Um, I can also recommend to download this. When you look into these complex societies, um, I mainly work with honeybees, also using bumblebees and, and stingless bees. And again, to trying to decipher um, if there's even the social lifestyle somehow um, linked to certain very fundamental evolutionary principles. And when you think about what is one of the major evolutionary principle, then you immediately may come up with, for instance, how males and females are developing. So it's a very fundamental and um, crucial question in biology. And you can see, OK, there are sexual dimorphic traits in males and females. And this is yeah, found all over animal kingdom, not only in humans, not only in sea lions and butterflies, even in some some marinic uh, worms like Bonella viridis, for instance, here, the green big one is uh, female and the male is as dwarf, as mini male somehow attached within the red circle. But also, of course, again, here in, in the bees. Here, for instance, <coughs> you see um, queen bee, worker bees, and the drone, the male bee. And one may ask, okay, how these different sexes arise? What are the main yeah, actions? <coughs> Um, underlying genetic components. And when you see into the animal kingdom, you see immediately a high diversity of sex determining mechanisms. You're probably aware of yeah, the pretty common um, widespread <laughs> known uh, sex chromosomal system. We can found it in mammals, the XY or XO system. We have in birds um, a Z or a or W system and so on. There are different uh, levels of environmental sex determination and chromosomes. But, and this is yeah, the interesting part here, we have haplodiploidy. Haplodiploidy can be found in particular um, in all hymenopteran species remembering all bees, wasps, and ants. What is haplodiploidy? Just to illustrate, haploid eggs are arise from unfertilized eggs. Whenever a queen bee, for instance, when we are here in, in bees, um, an unfertilized egg is laid, just get one copy of the chromosome, and it's haploid. And whenever there is a fertilization with yeah, male, then you get a diploid organism. And this yeah, has two different sets from the chromosome. This very fundamental principle was first described by a Polish priest, Jan Dziecian, already in the 18th century. And yeah, hundreds, almost 100 years, um, 80 years later, there was still um, this concept. Yes, there is uh, this principle of haplodiploidy, uh, but the idea arose that maybe in, for instance, wasps, there is a mode of interaction, of complementary um, action of one particular locus. It was unknown so far, but the theories and the crossing experiments from a, a small wasp done by Whiting uh, provided indications that obviously some locus is around in the genome, which of course they didn't know, um, that whenever this female lay unfertilized eggs, there is a yeah, haploid offspring for instance, having different forms of 
alleles. <coughs> and in combination to uh, uh, unrelated male, whenever it comes to fertilization of the egg, then the resulting offspring contains a heterozygous combination of the alleles resulting in female individuals. Interestingly, and this was already noticed by Whiting in the late 40s, last century, whenever there's an inbred cross, inbreeding with a yeah, male carrying the same copy of this yeah, particular unknown locus, the resulting offspring is in parts female, where I have this heterozygote level, and in other parts, you will get males, which then also are deployed because they got two copies, but they are homozygous at this particular locus. Most of the time, and this is particular, yeah, problematic in honeybees, for instance, um, these is, bees are a dead end. They do not survive. So to make a long story short, um, here in a Hallmark paper um, of 1977, where um, even um, colleagues from Brazil were involved, and I recently met Sila, and we're going to meet her in the, in the meeting um, two weeks uh, online, of course, uh, in Ribeirão Preto, and uh, still working. Um, Sila described um, that on this particular unknown locus, there must be a certain numbers of different alleles um, whenever honeybees are going to mate each other. And in this um, yeah, paper, they were estimated um, this unknown uh, number, and they came to, to values of, of up to 20 um, sex alleles, but they didn't uh, know what is the underlying genetic basis. So the question for the following slides are, I will take you to the journey of a yeah, very long, um, intense labor work, but with pretty nice um, yeah, results at the end overall. Because the question is, uh, what are the primary signal of sex determination in, in honeybees and how do they evolve? And um, do we have kind of regulatory cascade that leads to female and male development, how does it look like? Do we find even some signatures of evolution? Or do we find a common basis over the time of <clears throat> evolutionary divergence between species? To make a long story short, this goes back even to my time when I did my, my doctoral thesis as PhD. Um, this was actually um, yeah, two years of, of hard laboratory work and even some kind of frustration, but also at the end, a lot of fun. Um, deciphering this unknown locus, which we named yeah, complementary sex determining gene, which is the initial signal of sex termination in honeybees. And we could prove, again, this is a single locus, one gene copy, um, which produces many different alleles. And then exactly whenever you are heterozygous at this particular gene, the resulting offspring are females. And you see here in the case of, in the case of homozygosity at this particular gene, the resulting offspring do not survive. These larvae that are going to develop or hatched from the egg are recognized by the worker bees at the very early larval stage and they are eaten up, they are consumed, um, yeah, killed by the worker bees. That's why you have here such a scattered brood pattern a really yeah, dead end whenever it comes to inbreeding, which is of course has certain importance also for the population sizes and conservation aspects of bees in general. 
just to illustrate here, um, you have this particular gene which is, is characterized by certain domains marked here in color. I would like to pay your attention in particular to this um, yeah, hyper variable region. We come to that later again. We know then, interestingly, that within the honeybee genome, this single gene that produces many different alleles, the CSD gene, has a sister copy, which is a, a gene duplicate. And interestingly, we were able to understand also the function um, of these um, yeah, two gene copies. It is all summarized here in an abbreviation of a kind of pathway you can see here, where you find as initial signal here in the top CSD whenever the heterozygous starts regulating as the downstream target gene feminizer. And this again uh, needs a cofactor and detail is much more complicated and it produces different splice forms. And uh, whenever this feminizer gene is active as an actively female spliced form, the next cascade gene downstream is a highly conserved transcriptional factor, a double sex again in a female spliced form, and then initiate more stringently female development. <coughs> the male pathway is rather than a result here in a splice form of a truncated short protein. So this pathway this took a lot of um, yeah, work, not only by myself, but many co-workers and, and colleagues uh, from the Düsseldorf group were involved <coughs> in the group where I was an um, assistant previous time. We were particularly interested in to understand and to, to study where this gene come from and how it is evolved and what is going on with this um, gene duplication. And we looked into different Apis B species, Apis mellifera, Apis serrana, and the giant bee Apis torsata. And we were able to identify really signatures that concluded us that CSD gene is newly involved within the honeybee lineage by this gene duplication here marked in, in red area, where <clears throat> the feminizer gene, a kind of ancestor of that CSD gene, um, evolved in a much more also conserved way because it doesn't produce different alleles in contrast to the CSD gene. We noticed that shortly after this gene evolved, and it's been duplicated. Um, many different mutations within the gene has been accumulated much faster. It's kind of signature of positive selection. And once established um, here in the lineage, for instance, different alleles, these alleles are not yeah, so quickly get lost as one would expect under neutral evolution. So this is a very classical uh, and nice example of a neo functionalization. We call it in the concept of how genes get a new function whenever they become duplicated over time. One more particular interesting aspect within CSD, I just mentioned before, this hypervariable region, a region within CSD, is here illustrated among the different um, bee species, Mellifera, Dorsata, Serrana, and even the dwarf honeybee, Apis florea, are characterized by a kind of repeat amino acid length variation of different alleles. And this is really a hotspot 
of changes, a fast evolving area within the gene where you can imagine that these small and very easily changing, um, heavily changing region generates within short generation times new different alleles in a high evolutionary rate. Another interesting area within the CSD gene evolved also specifically in CSD and not in the ancestor gene feminizer. We call it here, we identified this so-called coiled coil motif, a protein motif that <clears throat> enables these different alleles from CSD to interact, to recognize each other simply spoken and to interact at the level of protein to initiate the pathway um, for uh, male or female development. By taking these previously mentioned 10B genomes <clears throat> again into in the, our data analysis, we were even um, screen and, and measure these um, evolutionary history of these CSD genes and the, the FEM copies. You see just here an illustration of the similarity of the different FEM proteins we found in the different B species. In comparison, um, also we included some, some ants and uh, a wasp. And we noticed interest, interestingly that within the different bee species under study here, the bumblebees, for instance, they show up in two copies also. But some others like the melipona, for instance, um, melipona quadrifasciata is here. Um, there's only one single copy of the fem gene. And we have also here seen already that different yeah, forms of selection um, acting in the evolutionary past to shape the diversity of these, these genes. When we now go into one of these lineages a little bit more in detail, the bumblebees, um, important pollinators, also prone, of course, to yeah, inbreeding whenever it comes to small population sizes. Um, we would like to understand also the underlying basis of, of sex determination more precisely. And just last year, we published together with many colleagues, together a larger study uh, where we were able to analyze 17 different genomes of bumblebees. And we focused here in particular again um, on the different gene copies, which are already here seen, feminizer again, and the copy, the duplication version of feminizer, we named it here FEM1. And we applied several yeah, analytic statistics to measure the evolutionary rate of amino acid changes compared to a neutral evolution. And we noticed that this FEM1 copy um, indicates signs of accelerated um, evolution or signs of higher evolutionary rate compared to FEM, which is pretty interesting. Nevertheless, <clears throat> we still um, need further uh, study to be done to fully prove uh, if at all a FEM1 copy is involved in the mode of sex determination as for instance a CSD um, in honeybees is, which is <clears throat> currently under study. So we see here in a nice example um, among closely related yeah, bees, but with a different um, yeah, evolutionary fate of these gene copies. When we now jump to the melipona stingless bees, as I mentioned before, yeah, this is an important point because we 
didn't find any copy so far from this uh, feminizer gene in the genome and even the transcriptome. Interestingly, we found different yeah, versions of yeah, sex-specific splice variances. <clears throat> this was done by a, a PhD student from the University of Manaus. Um, she spent one year um, yeah, abroad in my lab in Hohenheim. Did a great job and yeah, studied these different um, yeah, splice forms. And nevertheless, yeah, we haven't uh, still understood the primary signal of the Melipona stingless bees so far, although much progress has been done in the meantime. Just to conclude a little bit these parts of the evolutionary aspects. So we could show and we have now pretty good evidence that various evolutionary forces shape this key regulatory gene and their dynamics. We have at least very good um, understanding for a sex elimination pathway in honeybees. And we have with this CSD gene um, and this particular structure of the hypervariable region um, and a candidate to study high evolutionary rate and origin of yeah, innovation within the genomes. And by merging these data together, we have now a pretty nice model where we see here that across almost 300 million years of evolution, when you include like for instance, the Drosophila fruit flies and, and other far distant related insect species um, to a bees, that the initial signal of the sex elimination pathway can be highly diverse. You have maternal factors, you have haplodiploidy, you even have sex chromosomes. This can be highly variable, but altogether they are regulating and they come together to a highly conserved core element, which is here named tra. You can also backslash it for honeybees like fem and down to double sex as a transcription factor. And then at this basis again, you have a highly variable path of all the different morphological, physiological behavior and anatomical parameters shaping this enormous diversity of, of insect <coughs> species. So this is kind of hourglass model, um, which is now um, pretty backed up by a large amount of molecular data. Yeah, and this is mm, yeah my final slide. I would like to thank, of course, um, many people. Um, first of all, group members um, um, from Livestock Population Genomic Group, and and many previous co-workers and colleagues from the Düsseldorf and Cologne time and even people that support me during sampling for instance um, and high numbers of CSD sex determining alleles in Africa, colleagues from the US and from Canada and even yeah, a colleague uh, from, from China from the Bumblebee Genome Project and last but not least of course my long uh, standing and good colleague and friend, uh, Carlos Gustavo Nunes da Silva, um, originally placed at the UFAM and University in Manaus, and Diana Brito, this mentioned PhD student, <clears throat> again also from Manaus. Yeah. And this, I think I would like to thank you for your attention. I hope you got the points that I have mentioned and I am happy to take questions by whatever kind of language. Maybe I need some uh, to, to, to translate, translation from Patricia. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. It was a very interesting uh, talk.
And thank you very much for the talk. Um, well, Anna has arrived, so I think I will let her explain. I don't know if she prefers to explain Portuguese in English or both. I don't know, because we have people from many places here. But uh, about uh, Melly Bees, then we go to the questions. Yeah. Yeah, now you, you can yeah. talk. Okay. Hi. Yeah, I can talk. Yeah, so first of all, that's great. Uh, I'm very happy for, for this uh, series of talks to start. And very happy to to see this this um, this call and and I'm looking forward to hear. I, I was reading some questions and I'm looking forward for the answers. Uh, and yeah, so Mali is a German-based organization, but I come from Para and well, I used to live there at least, and I wanted to always help uh, making this bridge between the countries and bring some, um, also supporting some academic exchange and so on. And, but Mali is actually mainly focused on the local communities and environment to flourish. So we develop activities for that. And with that view, I believe that one of the main uh, things to happen is the development with the scientific uh, view with the scientific knowledge to support and we believe that um, beekeeping, native beekeeping, so meliponic culture can be a big key for that and that's what we are um, we are also for, uh, fostering. Uh, we also work with community develop, uh, community engagement activities and with uh, uh, land use uh, activities, so uh, regenerative agriculture or forest protection, but always in the in the big um, the big picture of um, of the community and and yeah. So that's that's about Mali, and I'm very happy to to bring Professor Hazelman uh, to this talk today. Thank you, Patricia, very much uh, for for uh, this opportunity as well, and Unicinos in general. Thank you, Ana. Obrigado. <laughs> it's uh, it's very nice to to have a partner to organize these uh, talks. Um, and uh, we have some questions. I will begin with the question that is more specific and then more broader questions. So, um, German Bonilla, she says, I thought that the amount of royal jelly in diet defined sex determination during larval development. Is it understood how diet interacts with genetic determinants of sex? Yeah, this is a good point. Um, diet um, interacts um, in the female, in the female way. Whenever, I mean, this fundamental principle of male and female development, this is in honeybees <clears throat> or in bees purely genetic based, from which we have best understood the honeybee with this gene CSD as a primary signal. However, when it comes to the caste differentiation, meaning the differentiation between queen worker, queen bees, and, and worker bees. <clears throat> so what is makes a different the queen development compared to, to a regular worker bee? Then nutrition comes into action. This is correct. But this is within females, not between males and females. Yeah. And uh, now I have a question, so I will <laughs> just uh, jump into yeah. that. Uh, do we have uh, more clues about how does it work for uh, melipona bees? Because there is no difference, at least in the amount of food <coughs> for queens and workers, not sexes. Yeah. So how does it work? Do we know more about this? Yeah, actually, I would love to <laughs> answer this question, but uh, so far, um, we have no 
no indication what is the the main gene of sex elimination. We we know um, these conserved elements, as I mentioned, feminizer we have characterized, and um, also um, colleagues from Brazil have characterized <coughs> and studied the downstream candidate gene, double sex. However, the initial um, signal and we didn't understood so far. And yes, you are right. I mean, this is uh, the still uh, the point uh, that, of course, the, the eggs are laid <clears throat> and then the cells are closed. And yes, and the, the proportion of food contributes um, also in Melipona bees um, to, to the differentiation of yeah, cast and uh, cast bee, queen and worker bees. But again, differentiation between the sexes, male and female bees, we we don't know so far about this primary signal. Okay, well, so that's good because we still have many things to to study. Oh yes, we have we have many questions. <laughs> sure, many things to do. <laughs> so Marina is asking: uh, Does the complementary sex determination system in bees? or hymenoptera in general, general mean that their minimal viable population size is larger than in other insects? If so, does this have implications in their conservation? Um, good question. <laughs> Muito obrigado. <laughs> um, actually, this sex we can divide this and so maybe um, the sex determination system, this principle of um, haplodiploidy and the problem or problematic situation of, of less fit or even non-viable offspring when it comes to inbreeding, this diploid male production I mentioned by inbreeding, this is particular problematic when it comes to small population sizes and fragmented landscapes, for instance, in terms of conservation biology, this is a very important aspect um, where I'm afraid that not comprehensively um, um, empirical data are available. Nevertheless, from the theoretical modeling <clears throat> colleagues, for instance, from Canada, Amber Syed um, did already very nice studies on that previous time. Um, they came up with this um, diploid male vortex, they named it diploid male vortex, a way um, how, let's say, population can decline and even break down when in, whenever um, you have increased numbers of, of inbreeding given by the low numbers of yeah, genetic diversity of different sex alleles within the population. And so overall, as this comes to the second part, um, um, when the queen is the only reproductive individual in a population, um, in a colony, for instance, um, then you see that the effective population size in social insects, or particularly in bees, are rather small. This is not, not from the theoretical point of view, not, not easy to follow. Nevertheless, I mean, you have reduced effective population sizes in, in honeybees. Um, given that the, the queen bee is, of course, the only reproductive individual. In honeybees, where you have multiple mating, usually a, a honeybee queen mates with up to 20 or 25 four drones, you increase <clears throat> the genetic diversity. This is correct. But for other bees, um, yeah, population sizes are, are a critical aspect and has immediately implication for the conservational biology aspects. Wow. Well, yeah. um, we have more uh, general questions here, not uh, related mm -hmm. to genetics, uh, uh, but um, Diego asked, um, 
Which strategies would you suggest for Brazil to take care of the stingless bees in a better way? Uh, scientific education, projects for schools and communities, and uh, he would like to know how does this happen in Germany? Ah, good. <laughs> good question. <laughs> Not easy to answer. I, I mean, actually, yeah, good strategies. I mean, first of all, raising awareness and, and showing the importance that every um, insect counts. I mean, even, I mean, we are now in the worldwide um, decline of biodiversity and um, and you, of course, also uh, have seen this um, international published studies of a dramatic decline of, of particular insects, but it's not only related to insect because it's a general um, all over um, phenomenon. And and so this again, um, even is is more important to raise the awareness <clears throat> to the public, um, to the to the government, um, to the politicians, and to even and this is a kind of maybe yeah let's say a movement that more and more, for instance, in Germany comes now from the bottom up, is really um, that the communities. <clears throat> all over um, the, the cities in the countries are come together in, in groups and initiatives are started, has been started to, to, for instance, provide resources for nesting habitats, for, for nutritional, for flowering, um, even for modifying the agricultural management or, or the management of meadowing um, public places to modify um, yeah, long-standing established um, aspects of how we treat our environment um, always under the um, aspect okay there are life cycles of, of insects that, for instance, now we have here in, in Germany, we have March. I mean, this is end of winter season and <clears throat> overwintering developmental stages of many insects are, are still in the grass trunks and, and, and plant um, parts and not hatched so far, for instance, as adults. And um, the awareness is now more and more um, that it is very important now not to cut the tree, uh, not to cut the meadows, not to meadow. Um, right now, better wait at least four to six to eight weeks um, until all the insects are like hatched from their <clears throat> overwintering stages. And in parallel, um, yes, I mean, the importance is really to, to provide um, information and, and educate people um, from all different levels. Because we noticed um, here um, that um, in general, whenever people are have a, a better understanding um, what's going on, whenever they say, for instance, meadow, yeah, too early and and they cut everything down in in autumn for instance and to clean their garden let's say it like this to remove every dry piece of plant uh, residues um, you remove automatically important uh, yeah, resources and places where insects can overwinter um, and and also thinking about in, in the long chain and by removing places where insects can overwintering um, <clears throat> in the different stages, you also automatically remove food sources for the birds that are here also in Germany, for instance, for overwintering, looking like, for instance, for beetles or for every kind of larvae under um, uh, plant uh, 
trunks or whatever. So there is this, this movement and initiatives at different levels to raise the awareness how everything um, is connected to each other and why it's important to to act at the different levels at the at the research level we have a pretty good understanding what's going on and we know so much um, of course we have still exciting questions <laughs> that we we want to follow um, but yes for the current status we have enough information um, to really get in a mode of action and this is absolutely mandatory that we all uh, come um, at the different levels um, together and yeah, convince people and and really show and educate um, people and this starts from yeah from the the simple person wherever uh, in a, what kind of uh, village up to the politicians um, or even stakeholders in, in companies uh, where they have money also to to change and to modify their way of how they treat their like for instance garden areas in in the companies so the different levels and this is some important and this happens stepwise yes it's a long way um, in Germany, but um, whenever you can yeah, initiate and continue this movement also in, in Brazil, um, this would be an important, important step. I I will jump in on this. I don't know. I think <coughs> it's sometimes missing the idea of the diversity of the bees and the importance not only of the apis, not only of the honey bee. That we see, like I think in Germany, there are so many people having honeybees in their backyard. I, I think that this this is already quite strong, but I see there's just a little lack of like actually bees. That's not the only bee that there is. <laughs> yeah. And, <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is this is this is the main point. Yeah, actually, um, initially uh, when it came to that uh, insect decline, everybody wanted to save the insects by putting honeybees in their backyard, and then they they started to 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 place a honeybee colony into the backyard or even on the balcony, um, in the in the third floor of a of a building in the center of the city, and. Of course, this is not contributing to biodiversity at all. <laughs> I mean, and this, yeah, this is the main point. We are really raising the awareness um, what biodiversity in terms of of insects, in terms of plant biodiversity, and of course the the mandatory interaction of, for instance, insects and plants are yeah related. And, and and why they are so also so needed and so important. Yeah. Yes, I have to agree. Like <laughs> here in in Brazil, I guess um, we have a long way to to raise our awareness. And um, it's here that the biodiversity is everywhere and they all year long. So yeah. <laughs> People take it for granted sometimes. And, <laughs> but I think here in Brazil we are starting to, uh, we are in this movement bringing awareness of having the, the native bees, the stingless bees, we are bringing a little bit more. I mean, 10 yeah. years ago we did, wouldn't hear at all about yeah. native bees. I mean, I would like to hear also Patricia's perspective as when you started studying uh, native bees, I don't know. <laughs> yes, no, we, uh, I noticed a change. Uh, but it's because of the honeybees. Because when I started studying bees, uh, I would say, ah, I study bees. And then people would say, oh, but they sting. <laughs> now they say, oh, they are disappearing. <laughs> so it's a good change, but they still, uh, most people that I talk, they don't know that there are other bees than stingless uh, than honeybees but but yes we are we are going in the right direction i i believe with the internet and uh, mm -hmm. we are reaching more people than than before there is 
one question for the same person, uh, Diego, but I don't know if you want to answer that or not, but uh, he asks you to talk a little bit about carbon fridge <laughs> because he is from Germany, but I, I don't know if he is actually from Germany. And um, be, how is how important is the dance of the bees to to put together humans and non-human animals, something like that, he's asking. Okay, I try to uh, get the main point. I mean, I mean, when it comes to bee dance, I mean, when it comes to the observation of the amazing behavior um, bees are performing, and this was, of course, uh, studied intensively by, by Carl von Frisch, I mean, we can learn a lot. I mean, by just looking at the bees and their behavior, um, I'm always fascinated and I still wonder, um, although I, you can read a lot of papers um, about that, um, but still there are so many mysteries out and we have um, on so many aspects no clue about um, how they um, interact and how they organized each other to perform certain tasks and to communicate. We know many things, yes, right, but um, by interacting um, in a such a highly social um, organized environment in a crowded, um, yeah, like situation, <laughs> like in, in a bee, um, bee colony, you can imagine that, um, yeah, in a interaction of humans. I mean, we can really uh, learn a lot uh, about that. And yeah, I mean, the, the importance to to communicate each other uh, to each other and and even to help to each other. I mean, this is uh, something that maybe even for the for the human um, yeah, uh, social community might be even nowadays more important um, uh, in general because I have sometimes the feeling that um, yeah, this uh, society is rather going to a way where in parts um, one, one would think about more about his own um, yeah, cosmos, <laughs> own life and uh, focusing kind of by um, their own way of living in the best way and not take care so many of of the neighbor and and this yeah brings me to the point that for a good human society i mean this communication is everything and and taking care and uh, going to an actively um uh, interaction to each other that this somehow is is working, and when you you see bees, I mean, uh, for how long they are already in that way? I mean, million of years, successful story, um, and they are still there, and so, and we are yeah, comparably um, short here on Earth, and we mess up so many things by our way how we deal with each other. So, so we can we can learn a lot of from the bees. Yeah, I have to I agree. <laughs> <laughs> can I jump with one question only because yes, you mentioned uh, the idea of of um, learning from the bees and so on, and and bringing the genetic perspective. Um, could you tell us about the genetic diversity of the native bees and the and the diseases because. The apes are known for having much more genetic diseases than the mallee. And do you think we can learn that somehow for applying for for other European bees as well? So uh, I don't know. I would like to just have a general with the genetic perspective uh, comments on, on, on that. Yeah, I mean, you mean um, like the, the diseases? I mean, of course, honeybees are heavily studied. I mean, you, you see um, um, many, many papers um, out there um, in, in which um, honeybee um, 
pathogens, um, pathogenic bacteria, protozoa, microorganisms, and, and viruses are described, and they are nice, nice reviews. And we did, we did also some some work on that in previous um, years about the dynamics and and the distribution, frequency distribution in, in of of pathogens in in populations, and. Compared to to stingless bees or, or native bees, um, much less is known so far. So um, and now stepwise, few groups starting to get a deeper look into uh, certain bees like solitary bees or um, bumblebees, and of course there's <clears throat> still um, many aspects of interest when it comes to potential spillover. From from honeybees that are highly managed to 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 wild um, unmanaged bees as potential impacting um, yeah the the spread of disease and there are um, yeah indications that this happens in in one way but um, on the other side um, I still miss um, many robust data that um, because yeah this is even more problematic. To, to screen the diversity of of all pathogens that are out in in the yeah bee or wild bee native bee or insect um, community and I'm pretty sure that many um, from which we have no clue so far um, are out uh, and this yeah this understanding is <clears throat> has um, has of course a, a certain importance. And for for Melipona bees, I, I to be honest, I yeah, I don't I don't know <laughs> um, how it's going. Um, what we we, we can yeah, yeah <laughs> what we can we, what we can see is at least I mean um, they they have strong yeah strong antimicrobial um, opportunities to to fight against yeah yeah bacteria. For instance, by collecting um, propolis, by uh, building resins <clears throat> in their hive, and, and providing uh, antimicrobial substances to control, yeah, growth of, of fungi, control growth of bacteria. They do this pretty well over over a million of years, and we are, I think, rather challenged by 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 the fact to how to study and and what to study to pick up suitable model organism let's say like this to 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 study this yeah maybe this yeah thank you <laughs> welcome well um, okay i guess we reached the time limit and i think in germany is already nine yeah, yeah so. correct yeah <laughs> So right. <laughs> I would like to thank once again uh, Anna for the co the partnership to organize this and for Martin um, to be here and give us a talk and it was very nice. Yeah. And I hope I will see you too soon. Yeah, that was also a pleasure for me. Thanks uh, uh, for for organizing this. Thanks for yeah for setting up this uh, this nice meeting and, and to the audience. Um, also, yeah, thanks for the uh, good and interesting questions. Yeah, and looking forward to to meet you um, on whatever kind of place again somewhere. Yeah, take yeah. care and yeah, stay stay healthy. <laughs> I'm also going to say that I'm super he uh, happy for, for that to happen. I'm super happy for the questions and for the other people coming around. So I would also like to remind that next month uh, in four weeks, there's another call in English here uh, and I'm looking forward as well. So I think it's the four, uh, 14th. No, yeah, I think it's the 14th. Well, I'll, there is outside on the website and yeah, I'm looking forward and yeah, hope to see you very soon again. <laughs> Okay, so yeah. then, yeah. Bon Take pessoal, care. Então. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> bye bye. 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 Uh, bom, pessoal, a gente vai encerrar então. E eu vejo vocês na semana que vem. A gente vai ter uma palestra sobre os insetos terrestres e o, 
e o Pampa, os campos, os campos. Então, vejo vocês na semana que vem. Até mais. Boa noite. Boa noite. Boa noite. Bye, bye. Bye.